I'm uh, head of engineering at Yanis Driving Car Project. Uh, my responsibility to create uh, all the algorithms which drives a car. And uh, today we will speak a little bit about some of uh, subsystems of self-driving technology. And oops, more technical problems. Work? Yes. Okay, very brief overview of self-driving technology. Actually, this slide was called self-driving 101. So, uh, just to be on the same uh, naming conventions. Uh, first of all, we need to know where we're situated. Uh, localization helps us with it. Uh, then we need to uh, detect uh, objects on the road, recognize uh, some road furniture, such as traffic lights and traffic signs, and uh, tech buildings and so on. Uh, and uh, then we need to predict the future, uh, to predict trajectory of other vehicles, to predict if, if a pedestrian would like to cross the street right in front of us. Uh, then a planning subsystem decide where to drive and uh, what trajectory to choose. And uh, finally, uh, control subsystem executes this trajectory with physical limitation, with limitation of our car, and so on. And HD maps are really useful for almost all of self-driving subsystems. And again, this uh, very famous uh, components, uh, they, I think, created uh, in the DARPA challenge and described uh, uh, about 10 years ago, and uh, they still uh, are relevant for self-driving tasks. Uh, today I'm going to focus on first two of them. Yes, I remember the presentation called Prediction and Perception, but uh, I I'll tell you a little bit about prediction, but mostly about perception. So I personally believe that perception is a key component of self-driving system. Uh, uh, the uh, better perception works, the easier to uh, implement other components. Perfect perception, uh, quite easy to make some decisions. If we have noise in perception, uh, decision could be uh, uh, it's much harder to make some, some, some decisions. So let's talk about perception and start about localization. So we need to know where we're situated. Uh, how can we do it? We can use different sensors. First of all, it's satellite uh, uh, information such as GPS, uh, but we all know that it's a really noisy signal. It's not precise signal. And uh, especially in Moscow, we have some issues with spoofing of uh, satellite signals uh, during some events uh, to prevent uh, drone flights and so on. Uh, so we need to use external information and how people localize themselves. They just remember a place uh, and uh, they try to analyze uh, what they see. So uh, we can do absolutely the same with algorithms. But the question is how to represent a map, how to represent an environment. We can represent an environment different ways. Uh, for example, we can provide explicit 3D representation. We can do landmark-based localization. And uh, finally, we discuss implicit representation of uh, environment, and let's start from 3D map. It's an example of 3D map uh, made from many rides around our office. Uh, and we use uh, 
some kind of slam technique to align all data and uh, create such kind of dense map. After that, we can uh, align our instant point cloud with dense representation and realize our position. The problem of this solution is uh, we need initial uh, localization to start uh, optimization problem. Also, it's quite computational expensive, uh, but uh, it's a really robust and uh, good way to know where we situate. Uh, another way to use some kind of landmarks, it could be poles, traffic lights, traffic signs, we have a map of landmarks, we have a, uh, a recognition of uh, these landmarks on our uh, uh, sensors, we can correspond the, the representation and uh, realize where we situated. It's a 2D representation, it's more robust, uh, but we need a lot of landmarks, uh, sometimes we don't have s uh, such landmarks uh, around us. Uh, what we believe uh, a lot, and it's quite uh, non-usual approach, uh, that's why I would like to tell you in more details, uh, we can use implicit representation, uh, which is, uh, we, we can use image search uh, index, similar indexes we are using for image search in our main product, and uh, idea uh, is quite simple. We drive in uh, uh, interesting location, uh, collect a lot of images. Uh, we know exact location of each image and put this image and position into, into the index. Uh, when we uh, have uh, an image from current right, make a request to that index find the closest images and its uh, approximation of our current position. Then we re can refine this position uh, because uh, uh, we can take two image representation and estimate uh, transformation between them. So here's a few examples uh, on uh, on the left, you can see images from some right. On the right, uh, closest image, images from the reference index, uh, and uh, light conditions are quite different. Uh, we experimented a lot with robustness. Uh, we try to match images from night summer uh, images with uh, day April. Uh, uh, images in April we don't have leaves on trees for example so uh, it's a really robust uh, thanks to uh, deep learning representations and another uh, technology we need to find nearest neighbors fast uh, my colleague Artyom Babienka uh, created different types of uh, algorithms uh, such as multi-index. Uh, idea behind it, we, we, we split uh, space on uh, different cells and first we need to find the closest cell and after that we are looking for closest uh, vectors inside this cell and uh, it's really important how to split uh, a space and uh, they showed that multi-index is quite great architecture they have a few more uh, generation of the structure but this uh, idea uh, gives us an opportunity to find images in indexes around 1 billion images on a single uh, machine. Uh, of course, we don't need this performance inside the car, but uh, 
it's a really great uh, idea for fast uh, neural sniper search. And finally, we need to align uh, a request with uh, an image in, in uh, reference index. Uh, it's an example of uh, Siamese architecture from uh, uh, paper Lascar at all. Uh, and uh, it, it, it works quite well. Uh, so we can estimate uh, transform between two images. So uh, this is quite simpler and robust approach for weak localization. And uh, uh, it works quite well even from one camera, but don't uh, forget what uh, a uh, vehicle usually have more cameras and errors in one direction usually compensated by uh, errors uh, from camera uh, porting to the first one. So uh, by our experiments we find that visual localization can give us uh, accuracy around one meter and uh, we expect uh, even better performance. Uh, no need LiDAR data, uh, we don't even no need GPS signal for uh, initial localization. Doc? Yep. Does it mean that you keep a database of pictures of the entire city locally in the car? Uh, we, we, we can uh, split it by tiles as well as we are doing for usual maps. We don't need to store whole city but uh, we, uh, that uh, representation is quite compact, so maybe we can store even whole city, but uh, it, uh, we, 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 it's not necessary to do. And one meter is good enough? Uh, it's not primary uh, uh, approach for localization. Uh, let's think about it like replacement for satellite signal. But I believe that it's possible to provide much, best, much better accuracy and uh, uh, maybe in future after a few more hacks uh, we can do it in primary approach for localization. Any more questions about localization? Did you use Record 34? Uh, for alignment here, uh, Yes, we experimented with Resident 44. Uh, it's quite complex architecture for inside the car, but uh, it's about alignment. Uh, another uh, idea how to improve uh, quality, we just uh, can uh, collect more data with uh, less discretization. So it's a balance between uh, architecture and uh, amount of data. And did you use same kind of feature extraction or? Uh, uh, actually not. Uh, we are using our main feature structure, uh, main feature extractor. So it's similar, but not 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 uh, Something provider. No, it's not. Pro it's uh, some tweaks uh, are ResNet, uh, but it's our main architecture, so I don't want to <laughs> tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, I try to find balance between openness and some secrecy. <laughs> uh, what? Ah, similar question. Okay. <laughs> About feature extractor, okay. Uh, let's switch to another important task for self driving how to detect a car. Uh, we would like to use uh, all that magic of deep learning, and uh, first of all, we need to collect a lot of data. Uh, to collect a lot of data, we need a labeling tool. Uh, for most uh, labeling tasks, in Yandex, we are using our own crowdsource platform, which is called Taloka, or Taloka. Uh, and uh, 
it's similar to Amazon Mechanical Torque, but our support team uh, sits inside and uh, all development inside, and uh, it gives us more uh, flexibility and uh, cost per task uh, better than uh, outsourced companies. Uh, so uh, we labeling data in 3D it is quite non-trivial task and uh, actually in the beginning we ask ourselves if it's possible uh, that common people can uh, make this kind of job but yes we managed to create uh, uh, interfaces and documentation which is appropriate for uh, crowdsourcing such kind of data uh, and so we have our own collection so we can use uh, deep learning to find cars. Here's an example of uh, architecture which is works quite well. Um, body is really similar to common uh, SSD network which is used for computer vision task for finding objects on images. Uh, but the magic in representation, how to represent point cloud as an input of neural network. Uh, and one of approach, uh, let's uh, take a, a bird's eye view, let's split uh, a space uh, on uh, 3D grid and extract uh, some kind of statistics inside each cell. For example, it could be the height of the highest point inside the cell. Or we can go even further and learn some representation inside the cell. Uh, for example, it could be point net. Uh, and uh, this representation, uh, so again, we have bird eye view, slices, uh, it could be dozens of slices, and we put this representation as an input for object detection network, and it's really similar to image, but uh, instead of three channels, we have 16 channels. And uh, finally, we predict uh, uh, object position and uh, object type. Okay. I just uh, give you some demo. It's it's one example how it works in real life. Yeah. Have you tried uh, 3D CNNs? Not uh, 2D? Uh, I'm not sure about 3D CNNs. Uh, I, I think uh, they have uh, problems with per performance. Uh -huh. Maybe we know some hacks how to increase performance, but I'm not sure. And, and, and another question, okay. if, if I'm already asking. Uh, I, I see that you do this type of detection on uh, LiDAR data only. Uh, so why not combine both, uh, uh, why don't you do the fusion before, uh, before the perception? Very good question. Uh, actually, uh, let me finish about this method, uh, about this approach. Uh, it is uh, uh, the first three approaches is a state of the art for Kitty data set, and uh, our approach comparable to them. Uh, it's and uh, but uh, at the same time uh, have much better performance, uh, which is a really important for industry application uh, and. Uh, all of these methods try to use images also. Uh, we experimented a lot in this approach with combining images and lidars, and it's really hard to achieve boost in performance using images. It's counterintuitive because we see that image gives us a lot of additional information, but for this task, for this data set, uh, it's hard to achieve uh, improvement. It's not the only approach we use for detect cars. Another approach is uh, 
uh, also use uh, images. Uh, but uh, in this representation, in this architecture, we didn't achieve uh, performance boost. Because uh, I, I'll tell about this problem later, but it's really hard task to fuse different types of sensors. So again, it's uh, one of approaches which we use for 3D object detection. Uh, this approach uses only lidars, uh, but uh, uh, of course we have uh, another types of algorithms which uh, fuse data from cameras and radars and so on. And another, uh, I, I really like uh, this task. It's instant segmentation task. Who can know what, what, it, what does it mean? Okay, one. Uh, so, who, who know what is semantic segmentation? Okay, semantic segmentation, we need to predict uh, the class of each pixel on image. Uh, it's a really great task. Uh, we can find cars on image, uh, try to project a LiDAR into image and uh, uh, understand where uh, car situated in 3D. But uh, the problem with this, this approach is that uh, if we have a row of cars, we can't uh, separate them from each other. Uh, and instance uh, segmentation uh, tells us about each instance, uh, it should be, uh, it should have different label. We, 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 we need to split uh, cars or uh, other objects on an image. And people do it uh, quite easily. And uh, instant segmentation is quite hard task. Uh, uh, we still don't know very good you know, approaches in uh, academia. Uh, and uh, most of approaches is some combination of detection and semantic segmentation. So we can use semantic segmentation, try to detect cars and cut uh, semantic segmentation. Uh, there are uh, some end-to-end -end approaches, but all of them quite complex. Uh, again, my colleague uh, Viktor Yurchenko, with collaboration with some uh, uh, other uh, academic uh, researchers from Skaltech University, create very, I, I really like this method because it's really simple. We in industry like simple methods simple approaches because uh, we don't like uh, program a lot and uh, <laughs> easy algorithms easier to program so yeah I, I, idea is to uh, change instant semantic segmentation by semantic segmentation uh, let's try to dynamically uh, uh, label data by colors and uh, a close objects should be different colors. It's it, it kind of coloring problem and we try to ask deep learning to solve this coloring problem. And so we just learn uh, semantic segmentation for color prediction. And uh, uh, moreover we can dynamically uh, uh, we don't need to connect a specific class to a specific color. We can do it during a train process. And finally, we can predict color and label and in post-processing extract different objects. And a few examples. In the center, our predictions. It's uh, it's in, in inference stage. Uh, so uh, d during the test time, we just predict. Uh, uh, we have uh, different classes. One class is a background. It's black. 
and uh, another class is leaves uh, uh, and uh, different instances uh, have different colors. So uh, neural network predict uh, different colors. We have a map uh, and uh, then we have some kind of post-processing, uh, which is quite simple, connected components and so on. Uh, so we, we just predict color as usual semantic segmentation. We can, we can use any semantic segmentation network as we, as we know. For example, we experiment yes. with uh, UNET, ENET, and so on. And uh, here are some static examples. It's some quantitative results. Uh, it's cityscapes, average precision. Uh, you can see that number is quite low even for state-of-the-art algorithms because instance segmentation is a really hard task. Uh, our algorithm, uh, there are a lot of nuances in all these algorithms. Uh, and uh, uh, we like to tell that our algorithm one stage it's something like uh, how SSD different from that uh, old complex multi-staged uh, object detection approaches. Uh, we have lower numbers, but in uh, uh, if we compare with our simple uh, approaches, it's quite competitive. Uh, and again, performance is an issue, so uh, it uh, works uh, approximate on real-time performance, but still instant segmentation is hard. It's still a research area, and uh, but uh, it would be really nice to have instant segmentation for self-driving. And you can estimate quality. It is quality on our data set uh, of network, which is trained on cityscapes. So we have room for improvement, but still. So colors can change. It's OK, because we dynamically change colors during a train. But it should be different for different uh, instances. <laughs> so uh, again, I really like uh, this idea. and. Uh, the current state of the art, but still uh, we, we need a lot of work to achieve uh, production ready result for instance segmentation. So uh, I, I, I provided short over, overview of free perception and mapping algorithms. Uh, a few words about prediction. Uh, it's really hard to talk about prediction because we try to share some approaches uh, for which we can provide some quantitative results. Uh, and uh, we don't know any relevant data set for prediction at all. And uh, moreover, uh, for prediction, we don't even have common uh, task formulation. Different companies, different uh, people solve different problems. What uh, uh, we call uh, prediction, when we actually, uh, we, we can talk about different level of prediction. First prediction, we can, uh, we can track vehicle by some simple smooth filters. For example, it could be common filter. Uh, we estimate uh, velocity and uh, direction of the vehicle, then we can predict its trajectory using something simple like ballistic prediction. Uh, we can tell that it just uh, drive the same direction as uh, uh, our estimation. Uh, after that, we can take into account road situation, uh, road labeling, uh, behavior of our uh, other participant of uh, road movement. So it's quite naive approach, uh, but uh, it provides very good baseline. So we just have ballistic prediction, put it on the 
lane map uh, and uh, execute some kind of motion planning for other uh, participants. But still, I believe that it's a really challenging task. Maybe it's one of the most challenging tasks of self-driving to predict uh, behavior of our participants. Uh, because we, when drivers see uh, a pedestrian, he can estimate if this pedestrian are going to cross the road. Uh, if we see that adult person uh, goes to uh, borderline, uh, we see that he's going to stop. Uh, if it's a child, or maybe it's uh, some person with headphones uh, uh, and uh, who, who is viewing our side, so driver can realize that uh, a person could cross the road in the wrong place. Uh, but still, it's a challenging task, but we see a lot of examples where uh, machine learning predicts human behavior better than human. So, I believe that the matter of time and the matter of uh, data sets and uh, we can predict uh, human behavior or, and our vehicle behavior better than other drivers uh, in close future using some end-to-end -end approach, put everything in neural network and it tells us where person are going to go. Annotating it's not a hard task here because we know uh, all our data is annotation for prediction because we have tracking, we have detection, so we can uh, see on history and into the future we have uh, data. So uh, annotation is quite uh, okay. That's why we need more cars. So we, that's why we would like to collect as much data as. We want, that's why we have the KPIs for numbers of autonomous kilometers to collect data. So I, I yeah, gave you a description of some of our algorithms, but for self-driving we need much more uh, approaches, methods, algorithms, machine learning, models. Uh, they have complex interconnection and uh, I believe that uh, uh, the winner don't have this, uh, the best algorithms right now. The winner is that who are going forward fast. Uh, so uh, that's why I would like to tell you about our pipeline to try something new. Uh, first of all, we collect all data we can from our vehicles. We put it into our cloud uh, data storage. Uh, then we apply uh, different manual and automatic uh, issue mining procedures for into uh, autonomous uh, driving. We collect all that problems, uh, label them, uh, put data into labeling, put uh, bugs uh, or feature requests on our software engineers and create new models or algorithms uh, deployed into a car. It's not easy procedure as Pavel described, but uh, we have that constantly improving process uh, and a few examples of our infrastructure, uh, Yandex table and data storage. Uh, we have our own uh, implementation on distributed uh, computation uh, and uh, we have our own data storage. We can make uh, uh, SQL-like uh, requests uh, to find, to extract interesting for, uh, data for us. We have anal analytics who, for example, I want more red lights of traffic light during a rainy night. And uh, uh, he can uh, make such kind of request, put these images into labeling and uh, 
few days later, we have new uh, model which works better with uh, similar kind of uh, issues. We have cloud mail. Uh, I, I, I called it uh, machine learning for housekeepers uh, uh, because uh, that idea that uh, uh, programmers uh, don't need to make a code inside uh, uh, editor, but can uh, make some blocks in uh, graphical user interface. Uh, and uh, something similar we have for machine learning, uh, but it really works. Uh, uh, reducibility, scalability, it's really wonderful uh, things. And uh, I'm happy to have uh, such kind of infrastructure inside the company. Uh, I already told you about Taloka, it's crowdsourcing uh, uh, tool set. Uh, it's an example of labeling cars for object detection. Uh, I already showed you this video for 3D object detection, but it's a really great um, uh, tool. And so, as I said, we have distributed computing, storages, cloud machine learning, uh, data labeling tools, and many, many other. And without all that infrastructure, much harder to move uh, forward, to uh, iterate fast, uh, especially for such kind of challenging task as uh, self-driving. Okay, and the uh, final part of my presentation, I don't know about time, but let's about change, challenges uh, and limitations of current sensors and uh, current machine learning approaches, uh, as, at least uh, which uh, in public academic uh, uh, work. So all you know uh, advantages and disadvantages for, for any sense of camera, uh, don't work during a bad light condition, uh, lighter, uh, we, we need uh, more density because on uh, large distances we have uh, two less points uh, on each object. So we need to combine all data together to use all uh, advantages. And But still, if you compare what human see from a driver's seat, it's something like this. You usually see only one or two cars in front of you. Uh, but uh, if you have radars and lighters on the roof, you can look much further. Uh, for example, on this image, first of all, you, you can see whole stand 360 degrees. You have four cars in front of us. Uh, you can see pedestrians behind uh, some cars parked uh, uh, on the left side of the street. And uh, I think it's not the most uh, interesting uh, example. Uh, so perception already can provide more information about environment when human drivers see. It's, it's one of example why we believe that self-driving is very close. But uh, uh, here are some examples. Uh, it's a visualization of raw radar data, for example. Somebody asked about radars. It's raw radar data, and it's really noisy. Uh, yes, we can filter out radar data by, do by velocity using Doppler effect. Uh, but then we have problems with static objects on the highway. We all know examples. Uh, another issue with LiDAR, uh, any dust, uh, any fog or snow, uh, we see some noise on LiDAR. Uh, fog is completely hell, but uh, here you can see dust. It's dust in our testing facility, uh, and it looks something like this. We need to work with additional filtering algorithms uh, to remove all that noise. Black car problem. Uh, so modern lighters, at least Velodyne, have problems with black cars. Uh, and uh, 
two, uh, not, not so many points on it. And uh, for example, we talked to uh, Anna Petrovska. She created an algorithm for detection black cars uh, uh, many years ago. And idea quite simple. If we uh, don't see points, uh, it's, it's, it should be object there because uh, uh, it's impossible to have hole on the road. But uh, the first question we have, uh, what about puddles? Uh, she said that uh, they don't have puddles in California. So, <laughs> but we have puddles in Moscow and we need to distinguish that holes uh, from uh, uh, black cars. So uh, it's an example of uh, when, when we look uh, for improvement of sensors uh, and it's impossible to dis it's really impossible to distinguish uh, specific uh, shape paddle from from a car uh, and uh, about cameras we have a lot of problems with cameras of course dirty rain blur uh, and uh, it's also not the best examples but, but just to provide you a little uh, insight. Uh, and uh, so we need to work with all that noisy data. And again, challenges. Uh, any noise in data, we can smooth it, uh, uh, but any smoothing causes latency of prediction, of uh, tracking. Uh, there are a lot of corner cases, such as puddles, dust, fog, and so on. Sensor fusion is a really hard task. I, may, I gave you an example of 3D object detection, uh, and I, I uh, showed you state-of-the-art approaches, but none of that state-of-the-art approaches uh, provided uh, proof that image helps uh, to improve quality of uh, 3D object detection. Yes, they use image, but uh, they didn't do comparison. So, because it's a really uh, hard to combine data from different modalities. Uh, and uh, you really need great collaboration and uh, time synchronization. And uh, sometimes it's impossible. Even you perfectly calibrate camera against slider, uh, uh, all cars have uh, some imperfection in, in hardness, uh, so further you uh, have distance between camera and LiDAR, more uh, problems you have with calibration. So uh, we uh, constantly research new machine learning approaches which are more robust for uh, synchronization and calibration. Because we, we don't have such problem for eyes. We can close eyes, uh, wear some glasses, uh, and uh, brain is very great to work with all the problems. And uh, so I believe that it's possible to create a robust machine learning algorithms in this field also. I thought, how is that, I mean, carbon filter, not a machine learning task, so how, how does machine learning help in uh, synchronization and calibration, in pre-processing of the data before the filter? Or? Um, you mean that, no, for, for example, we can put data from image and LiDAR inside a neural network. Okay. And uh, if you have perfect calibration, yes, it's possible to train something. If you have some problems with calibration sometimes, it's much harder. Uh, and uh, example, when it works, for example, uh, we know that classic approaches for stereo images. We have, uh, we have two, two images. We can optimize uh, something between them uh, and uh, estimate distance. And this approach is new. Requires really great calibration between two cameras, but if we put it in neural network and ask to predict uh, distance, we can sometimes 
uh, work with uh, on calibration. And uh, the similar story could be for time synchronization because we have a shift between a camera and LiDAR. And uh, that's I believe that uh, it's possible to create machine learning which is robust for, for, for such kind of imperfection. It's not filter, it's, um, I talk about signals from different sensors. Uh, no, yes, we can use Kalman filters uh, for uh, estimation pretty position, for example. Uh, but still, if you have different uh, detection from different sensors, uh, it's harder to combine them using any kind of sensor, uh, any kind of filtering. So I think about it not about implementation of Kalman filter, but about uh, estimation that clip, refinement that calibration right during uh, uh, prediction. No, as I said, we need to move fast. We have a lot of challenges. We need to try uh, new sensors. We need to try new algorithms. Uh, we are waiting from a research community new approaches uh, and uh, so on. And uh, I personally believe that uh, self-driving is one of the uh, most complex tasks uh, right now in the world. Uh, uh, maybe you know, more complex task in some theoretical physics, but uh, if we talk about practice applications, the rank is really, really hard uh, and need uh, a lot of efforts of different people. Uh, we at Yandex try to be as open as possible uh, to discuss uh, problems, to, to find uh, the solutions. Uh, and uh, try to move fast to self-driving future. I would like to, as Artem said, uh, uh, you don't want to listen to us, but uh, prefer to uh, watch more m movies. It's our first public video, uh, 13 months ago. It just uh, uh, more than a year ago. Uh, and uh, it's our first ride, first ride without a uh, driver. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, I don't know, it, it was quite naive. Uh, we see a lot of problems here, uh, but uh, anyway, it uh, first drive on the closest area. Is uh, it polygon? This is your, uh... No, no, it's not our uh, testing area, it's area next to our garage, garage. Uh, uh, which could be considered as closed since not, not everybody is allowed <laughs> there. It's not, it's not, it's not technically closed, but we, uh, when we make this test, we uh, try not to, to, to try for, for a bit of other people to drive here. Uh, after showing this video, uh, everybody said that your wheel too, too jerky, uh, but we, we was too happy that it, it drives by, by itself, so we, we, we just didn't see it. It's Pavel. <laughs> Pavel inside the barrel. Actors? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was not long time ago, just a year ago. 
and, and uh, this video maybe you already seen this but uh, it's just a comparison uh, of what we achieved for by last year and uh, I, I personally are really proud uh, our progress uh, it's uh, right just after, after very heavy snow in Moscow uh, people walking around the road because uh, uh, p pedestrians are, uh, d d didn't why, clean. Why, why are you covering the Toyota symbol on the steering wheel? Because Toyota didn't pay us any money. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, uh, yeah. so that's it. I can handle that. Uh, as soon as they bring me some money, you know, I'll see Toyota all over there. <laughs> Politics. <laughs> I, uh, I have actually a question regarding the snow. Yeah. How, how do you handle a slippery, slippery road? Uh, after rain, after snow? Uh, we have... Uh, uh, we, we need to improve our control. We, we detect uh, some slipperies. We have uh, odometry from every wheel. We have uh, inertial measurement unit, accelerometers and so on. So we can detect some... Uh, uh, different uh, estimation of position from different kinds of sensors. Something similar uh, happened into uh, ESP systems inside a car, but we really expect all this uh, solved by a car. We, we, we are expecting from car manufacturers API, we would like to drive by this trajectory, something like this. Right now we need to implement all that control uh, and uh, by ourselves. How confident uh, are you, on, for example, braking on, on ice? Yeah, we, we just uh, have different sets Maybe even of... Impossible to break. Yes, but you can uh, incre decrease speed, first of all, it's, it's quite low speed, it's 25 kilometers per hour. Uh, some uh, human drivers uh, uh, don't like it's uh, too slow, but it's really uh, complex environment. We, we can expect pedestrian uh, move out from any car at any moment. So it's really comfort speed there. Uh, and uh, it's if uh, on slippery road, we just decrease speed, uh, increase uh, distance from the fo uh, following car and so on. Just like normal human drivers. Yeah. Oh, that's it. So, 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 so you constantly ensure the correct braking distance, for example? Yeah. At, at least we try. No, I mean uh, that if, if, if something uh, wrong could happen, of course, if somebody uh, un, uh, uh, unpark its car right in front of us. Yeah. And yes, uh, in case of slippery road, we need more uh, breaking distance, but it's uh, the only thing we can do, just uh, uh, slow down uh, on the road. So, so do you, you also have, uh, for example, weight estimation of the vehicle itself? For, so you need it for a calculation for, for the distance, for example? For uh, we have uh, an implicit estimation of vehicle dynamics. So you don't uh, don't have don't, don't uh, use this uh, information. Uh, uh, weight, weight uh, not not in explicit way, because actually sometimes we have five uh, riders inside the car, sometimes uh, only one. But usually the way you handle this is very similar to human drivers. So uh, it's a common problem in Moscow. So uh, uh, when some precipitation happens, specifically if it's heavy rain or heavy snowfall. The average speed on the road drops like twice. Yeah. So basically, this is the same thing. That's what you think. Uh, okay, uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, I would be happy to answer all your questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, thank you for invitation. Really great discussion, and I hope we. You continue some kind of connection with the community. Yes, actually, yeah, a lot of people are asking for you know, uh, this part. So I don't know if you want to. Uh, <laughs> we ran out of them. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> I, for, I, I for, forgot all of them in my jacket. Uh, 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 uh,
But you can email, feel free to send me an email. I'll try to answer everybody. Yeah, we've been here for two days, and we, unfortunately we ran out of business cards. But we would be happy if, if basically, if we leave contacts with you, you have our emails, obviously. So we are happy if we can show it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I have uh, just uh, a couple of quick, quick questions. So you didn't I say remember you from General Motors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a couple of quick questions. You didn't say anything about your planning algorithms. So is it, can you say anything? Is it rule-based? Did you try reinforcement learning? Uh, or did you go there? Uh, OK. Uh, planning algorithms. Uh, <laughs> what what's planning algorithms? <laughs> uh, I'm here about, to talk about percent. No, actually, uh, uh, it's a very large uh, field uh, to talk about. Uh, first of all, Reinforcement lear learning don't work. <laughs> <laughs> in case for, for this uh, application, no, I I, I almost sure. Uh, maybe you, you can uh, find some tricks uh, to make it work, but uh, uh, I, I'm not sure it easy way. Uh, there are a lot of uh, good classic approaches for planning. Uh, it's uh, r right now um, our experiments in terms of if it's possible to Im improve motion planning using some motion learning, but classic classic uh, motion planning is really good, basically. So my answer is this one. So is, is it rule based or is it like a tree search or is that what you mean by motion planning? Uh, I mean by motion planning when we decide uh, when we have uh, some environment model, uh, it could be occupancy grid plus dynamic objects uh, with uh, velocities. In simple case, in harder case, we have uh, more complex trajectories of our vehicles and prediction of the uh, way. So we need to find uh, shortest path in this kind of environment. So classic algorithms, yes, we need a lot of tricks. Uh, we need a lot of performance uh, tricks uh, to make it work. But it works uh, quite well if we have good uh, environment model. But again, as I said, we better prediction we have, easier to program motion planning. If, if, if you have noise in the environment, it's a mess. It's uh, you need to smooth it. Uh, latency is uh, increased. And so on. Uh, no, we, we can split motion planning on two major components: uh, motion planning, uh, plan, planning, uh, which about uh, find the best trajectory and behavior layer. Uh, which uh, takes into account higher logic about lane changing, stop on uh, red light, and, but also splitting is really uh, not trivial. For example, lane changing, is it behavior layer or motion planning? Uh, to lane change, we need to decide that we need to change, but when you want to change lane, it's a kind of optimization problem. You, you can decrease speed, increase speed, and sometimes you can de uh, decide not to change lane. Uh, and uh, it's uh, also, um, yes, we have a, a splitting uh, uh, general motion planning by behavior layer and motion planning, but actually we have a lot of coupling inside it. And just another question about, uh, you said that when you talked about prediction, you said that uh, you use ballistic prediction and that you, there's still a lot of challenges to go there, but did you try to uh, look at uh, ML, like supervised learning? Uh, uh, I mean that it, it, this is definitely the area where machine learning are uh, very good option. And I, I just provide you some example what, of what is prediction. The, na uh, the most naive approach is ballistic prediction plus maps. But of course, it's far, far 
from something which is uh, usable. And uh, yes, uh, we use uh, machine learning here. Um, and uh, but uh, again, uh, I believe there are a lot of challenges there in machine learning to predict all that uh, non-standard moves. You must have uh, very funny stories about how, how people respond to self-driving cars. So, uh, uh, yeah, yes, one of the first story about communication, communication with external people. Uh, uh, we have testing area uh, right next to our garage, uh, which you've seen on the first video. Uh, I made uh, some tests. I was alone in a car, sit uh, and do something. Um, uh, and uh, uh, some guy uh, goes on uh, gear a scooter, uh, uh, look into window, gy gyro scooter. Uh, he rides right uh, to the car, ask, oh, it's Yandex still driving? Uh, but we was in self stealth mode. We didn't show that movie. Uh, uh, I don't know um, uh, where, where he find any information about us, uh, and uh, I usually said uh, we're just testing a car, but uh, I, I didn't, don't, didn't fi find what to answer. I said, yes, it's Yandex of driving. What, uh, what are you doing? Uh, uh, he said, uh, nothing. I, I'm just selling dry fruits. <laughs> A guy on gyro scooter uh, know about self-driving, about our project, but uh, uh, I, I don't know. Pavel, do you know? Very many stories. Yeah. I, I'm just choosing the one. Because, uh, actually, was the car probably painted already mm, with self-driving uh, Yandex <laughs> logo? <laughs> Not that time. And, uh, so there are many different ideas from people around what's on the roof, about the wider. Someone thinks that this is air quality measurement thing. <laughs> uh, someone thinks that this is a camera, just to find someone who prohibited them. Rules. Yeah, yeah, so. Uh, uh, and the uh, most interesting thing was about the legal workers when they saw the car, our car, uh, on the road, they do something like this uh, because they think that this information we sent to their special government organization <laughs> is to uh, send them home. And uh, this video. Uh, so when we drove to the Kazan, uh, this 12 hours driving. So I drove after this car, uh, after our previous, just, just to see what's happening. And uh, uh, so actually there were many equipment inside my car. Uh, and uh, I looked at behavior from other drivers. So they drove something about 150 kilometers in the roads where the limit is 10, uh, 90. And when they saw our car, they think this, this is something like a police car or something like uh, a car which detects this uh, behavior and send uh, fines to them. So they, it, 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 it looks like this 150, 90. So yeah, actually, there are many stories. Every day something happened. Yesterday, police car stopped, the, stopped our car. Uh, and it happened like in the, for the very first time in the Kazan. Uh, and it happened like in the cinema, in the US cinema, with a lot of signals, lights, wheel, wheel. Uh, so they go to the car and start asking about wires. So, what is it? Is it a point cloud or something else? So, no documents, no anything else. They just. Start I'm very curious. Yeah, they, they, they were curious about technology. So, 
Do you have an official permit, uh, Russia-wide, uh, to move, uh, to drive such uh, vehicles? Uh, I already explained, so it's, a, it's an interesting topic because in Russia it's currently uh, a gray area. So there's nothing... You do not need a permit. Uh, yeah, well, so first of all, we need to certify any changes we make in the construction of the car. So basically to put something on top of the car, you need to certify with, with the road police and the pass the test that it's kind of road safe, which we do. So basically, our cars are officially certified. They have the kind of, kind of stamp in the papers that uh, the, the, the changes are officially certified. But that's it, because there's nothing stating or uh, implying that there might be self-driving cars on the road. So technically, they are not prohibited. The only requirement for public roads, uh, according to Geneva Convention, is that there should be a driver. So there is a driver behind the wheel. But nothing, uh, uh, but nothing basically forces the driver to keep their hands on the wheel or legs on the pedals. So that's why, as long as there is a driver, mm -hmm. technically, there's no law prohibiting uh, anyone from doing like self-driving. But that's not a very good situation because, again, since it's a gray area, uh, it might be, you know, changed very quickly. So that's why we working with, uh, with the government to kind of, first of all, introduce the terms of uh, kind of highly automated vehicle or vehicle with the like, uh, increased level of automation and also define the rules or how, like, basically we're trying to work with the guys to uh, define the rules and how basically companies could be allowed to conduct the testing. But if you, for example, stop with the road police, we, 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 we will stop. have some paperwork to show them? But, well, we're showing them that this is the car with the certified changes in, in the construction. So uh -huh. this is a vehicle which oh, has modifications which are allowed by the certification authority, which is NAMI in Moscow. So since the, all the changes, so, so basically they officially, there's nothing they can basically use against us in this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. If we have time, we can move to that uh, and uh, drink some beer.